Yu Tran. Um, and today we're going to talk about my DNA results. Can you hear me, Harris? Yes, I can. Sorry, it's, uh, a, it's little, a bit delayed, eh? It looks like it's a little bit delayed. Um, but Jody, I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about your results, to kind of explain to you uh, what we're able to determine from the um, from the tests that we do, and sort of you know why our test is so impactful as opposed to some of the other tests out there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to preamble this by letting you know and letting your viewers know that personally, I'm not a clinician, uh, but I have worked with clinicians before, and um, I've trained under Dr. Mansoor Muhammad. Uh, to understand the test that he provides from a non-clinical perspective, sort of the impact and some of the things we can learn. My background's in pharmaceuticals. I worked in pharmaceuticals for most of my career, uh, and I left after obviously um, understanding what that industry was like and understanding the importance of, of functional medicine, of natural healing, of exploring avenues outside of pharmaceuticals. So that's my that's where I come from. And I've had the opportunity, you know, the amazing opportunity to sit with Dr. Mansoor, who is a world-renowned clinical genomicist, and really understand, you know, beyond what people think about DNA is how your genes can have a functional impact on your health and lifestyle. Uh, so Dr. Mansoor is the founder of a concept known as functional genomics, and that's essentially understanding how genes that have a specific function in your body are impacted or interact with other factors in your life, so your environment, your nutrition, uh, your diet, etc. And what we want to be able to do is understand, well, what are the not only the genes, the individual genes, but the gene pathways that are involved in some of these critically important biological systems, systems like cardiovascular health, like brain health, hormone health, diet, metabolism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can learn some very telling things from looking at our genes as long as we look at them through an intelligent analysis. You know, this isn't a, your typical at-home recreational DNA test. It's a, uh, it's a tool. And, uh, you know, we provide this tool for functional practitioners like yourself mm -hmm. so that you, in turn, can provide your patients or clients um, with information that they may not necessarily have had or that they didn't really understand and give them sort of uh, an understanding that works for them. Great. Uh, to begin, uh, I'll tell you sort of the systems that we look at. Uh, there's six major systems that we look at. Um, the mm -hmm. first is executive function. Executive function is understanding an individual's unique emotional response to external stimuli. So really, how do you perceive the world around you? Uh, and it has a lot to do with understanding how neurotransmitters or neurochemicals in your brain, like dopamine, like neuroadrenaline and serotonin, uh, how they are produced, how they are managed, and ultimately how they are excreted, uh, and what that results in, in terms of the outcomes that you see from the different uh, balances of these, of these neurochemicals. We also look at the cardiovascular health uh, system. Uh, and when we're talking about the genomics of cardiovascular health, it's a unique uh, viewpoint. It's not looking at, you know, cholesterol numbers or stuff you typically hear, but we're trying to understand what's the etiology uh, or the root cause of some of the developments of cardiovascular disease. So, you know, what we have found is being able to predict the, um, the I guess, the ease in which the body uh, becomes inflamed, your propensity towards inflammation, and your unique inflammatory response has a lot to do with cardiovascular health. Um, following that, we look at methylation. Methylation is an important cellular process that occurs, you know, billions, trillions of times a second. And it's involved in many critical functions within the cell. It's most notable for um, the anti-inflammatory response in the body. So. A good methylation cycle means that your cellular or body's response to inflammation uh, is good. And subsequently, a poor inflammatory, uh, poor methylation cycle means a poor anti-inflammatory response. Uh, we look at diet and metabolism. We're looking at the genes that have association, uh, first of all, with satiety. How quickly do you feel full? It's a big one. Uh, your association or your relationship with different macronutrients, uh, fats and carbs, for example, 
Are you able to metabolize and digest carbs and fats and what that means? Excuse me, in terms of weight gain, obesity, some of the you know associated disorders with uh, food consumption. We look at detoxification, uh, specifically phase two detoxification uh, through the glutathionization process, understanding how the body produces glutathione and when it, whether or not it's effective in this production of glutathione. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we look at um, the hormonal cycle. So really trying to understand from a genomics perspective, you know, what's the cascade from which uh, steroidogenesis occurs, the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, how are they produced? And so that's really an overview of what we look at. And each of these panels has a fundamental impact on your health and lifestyle. Uh, so right before we jumped on here, Jody, you were mentioning that you'd like to, you know, sort of dive into mental health uh, and understanding how that's impacted by genes. And I think that's a great place for us to start. Yeah, before we dive in, though, um, just to clarify for our viewers, so I know there's lots of other tests out there. So the difference between something like a 23andMe and you guys, can you explain to the viewers what that might be? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, recreational at-home genetic tests, uh, like 23andMe, um, they're fo they've done a lot for DNA testing. They've obviously brought it to the commercial, you know, limelight. They've made DNA a buzzword in health and wellness. But we have to understand that, you know, first of all, genetics as a science, it's not a matter of one gene results in one outcome. It's not that if you have a variation in one gene, you're always going to have this outcome. Rather, genes work. Uh, as part of cycles, you know, pathways. And so sometimes you can have a gene that's supposedly functioning appropriately, and yet the outcome is indicative of a, su of a suboptimal gene variation. Mm -hmm. And the reverse is true too. Sometimes you can have a suboptimal gene, but you don't necessarily show suboptimal health outcomes. And that's because there are genes upstream and downstream from the gene you're looking at that could be working efficiently or inefficiently. That's number one. Number two, um, what we what we do here is identify genes that we have we know are clinically validated to have a function, meaning there's an actual impact of the gene we study. There's a lot of genes out there. You know, there's thousands and thousands of genes. 20, 23 me tests hundreds of genes. When you're not a hundred percent sure of whether or not a gene has a known association to health outcome using statistical analysis to assume that, okay, this gene has been associated with X outcome. And that can get a little bit uh, confusing for the, for, the, for the average consumer. For example, if you say, you know, that I have this gene and it means I, you know, I like to work out like this, and you don't work out like that, well, the average consumer is going to read that and say, well, that's not me, right? That isn't necessarily what I do. That doesn't make any sense. So when you re generally what we find is when people receive their 23 new results, a lot of that information is um, it's cool, it's nice to know, but it really isn't going to have an impact on changing your behavior. Okay. Okay. Right? At the yeah. end of the day, you want to be able to do a test that's going to change your behavior. Right. Finally, the gene that you're doing tells you that you have green eyes. Is that going to change your behavior? or that you're 2% Chinese, is that going to make you want to eat Chinese food? No. It's just cool to know, no impact on your actual health. Okay. Okay. So those are things, right? Um, and when I get into my explanation of some of these genes, you're going to understand exactly how you can change behaviors to improve your genomic outcome. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll begin sort of the, <clears throat> the analysis through uh, executive function and really understanding how genes have an impact on your executive function. Uh, so as I mentioned before, executive function is understanding an individual's unique emotional response to external stimuli. Um, how does an individual, uh, you know, display uh, emotional phenomena like uh, pleasure, pain, sadness, happiness? Um, and what about disorders that come with those phenomena like addiction, depression, PTSD, anxiety, binging behavior, et cetera. Uh, and what it has to do is understanding uh, the axes of neurochemicals. So what is the relationship between our brain and the neurochemicals we, we produce? And the first one we'll talk about is the neurochemical dopamine. 
A lot of people understand dopamine as the, uh, the pleasure neurotransmitter. And uh, it's, 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 it's not quite encompassing everything dopamine does. Dopamine isn't just pleasure. It's, um, it's understanding the excitatory emotional response. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it can be positive and it can also be negative. And dopamine, uh, the dopamine life cycle is, uh, is influenced by two very important functional genes. The first is COMT, C-O-M-T, catechol o methyltransferase and the second is DRD2. Your COMT gene produces or codes for an enzyme by the same name, COMT. And this enzyme is in charge of methylating catechols, uh, which include neurochemicals like dopamine, uh, so that you basically render them inactive and unusable. So what happens in the pleasure response is, you know, let's say you go home and you find out that your, I don't know, your brother or your spouse or so, someone has made you a slice of New York cheesecake, right? And you're a fan of New York cheesecake, and so you see the cheesecake, and all of a sudden you start to get really excited. So for, people have different responses to that. Some people who are you know, who really like their cheesecake start to salivate, start to think about it, they get really excited. At this point, no dopamine has been released yet. The minute you bite into that piece, there is a wave of response that comes over you. That's the instance where dopamine has bound to the receptors in your brain. The DRD2 gene determines the number of receptors you find on the postsynaptic cloud. Okay, so really how many receptors do you have to bind to uh, dopamine? That's going to determine the readiness or intensity of your pleasure response. The more receptors you have, uh, the, the quicker or the re more readiness that you have to experience pleasure. Your COMP gene determines uh, the length of time that dopamine remains in the synaptic, in the, in the, in the synaptic area um, to be available for binding. And so when you have a fast version of the COMT gene, what you're doing is you're producing a faster version of the COMT enzyme. And a faster version of the COMT enzyme is able to methylate and deactivate dopamine at a faster rate. Right? So if you had to take a fast version of the COMT gene, a fast version of the slow gene, and you produce enzymes, and you put them in a, in a bottle of water that had dopamine molecules, uh, the faster version of the enzyme would deactivate dopamine at a faster rate, okay? This translates into the length of time that you experience pleasure. Okay. One has length of time of pleasure, of length of the pleasure response, and the other is the readiness or intensity of the pleasure response. Okay. Based on... Here. So sir? do I want a slow comp gene or do I want a fast comp gene? Like, what's ideal? Cool. What do people want? That's a loaded question, right? <laughs> so... Um, it's not whether or not you want a fast or a slow one. It's really, okay, what am I blessed with and how do I manage that? So the ideal combination, right? Let's talk about the ideal, the combination that is the most ideal pleasure response. The ideal combination has a medium speed comp and a high DRD2. So you have a good amount of receptors and you have a decently fast comp enzyme. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the extremes. When you have a super fast COMT, and you have a high, or sorry, a low DRD2, what's happening is two things. Number one, dopamine isn't binding to as many receptors because there's not as many as there normally is. Uh, so the readiness of the pleasure response is, is lowered. And then the fast COMT um, actually is clearing out that dopamine uh, before it can bind to the actual receptor. So individuals who have this combination generally tend to show um, a propensity for reward-seeking behavior. It's like the, you know, you know that song by the Rolling Stones, I Can Get No Satisfaction? Yeah. That pretty much epitomizes fast comps, slow D, low DRD2s. So these people we're going to see with potentially addiction tendencies, right? Because they're going to be looking for that reward system over and over and over again because they don't get it for long enough. Yeah, and it's generally something you see, and it's not, you know, addiction is a, it's an interesting topic, but the type of addiction we're going to see here is an individual who is chasing, right? He's always chasing, you know, the proverbial high. Okay. Uh, and um, 
you can structure that uh, that addiction in your life for good things or bad things, right? So some people are addicted to success. They're addicted to business. They're serial entrepreneurs. They are addicted to the idea of building something, growing it, and selling it. So they become addicted. And that's, you know, for them, that's a good addiction. But if you aren't constantly challenged, if you're not challenging yourself, if you're not pushing yourself, then you can start to run into issues where you're going to search for that high somewhere else. And sometimes that goes down a, you know, a darker path. So you can be addicted to business or you can start becoming addicted to alcohol and drugs, et cetera, whatever it is. It's just you're looking for that pleasure response. And if you're not doing work that's fulfilling, if you don't feel challenged enough in work, you might seek that, that reward somewhere else. So an important distinction then is just because you have perhaps these two genetics um, coming together, doesn't mean that you're going to end up in a drug and alcohol addiction. It no. just means that you're more likely to seek out rewards on a regular basis. That's um, right. It could be good or it could be bad. That's up to you. So it's yeah. not, oh, you have these genes and you're going to be addicted. No, it's alcohol, just it's just right? understanding your uh, your um, your pleasure response. How do you actually feel like you've experienced some pleasure? And once you understand that, then you can structure your life where you have things in your life that give you that pleasure response that aren't going to be detrimental to your health. Right. On the other end of the spectrum, you have individuals who have high DRD2 and slow COPT. So they have a lot of receptors here. They bind to pleasure, you know, they experience that pleasure fairly quickly, and the dopamine stays in their body for a longer period of time. So these individuals uh, are generally going to exhibit somewhere along the lines of binging behavior. Because what's happening here is they're, they're the kind of people who really sink their teeth into whatever it is they're doing, right? So just doing it isn't enough. They need to do it for an extended period of time. So you're talking about, you know, you guys who love watching five hours of Netflix, right? They can't watch an episode. They have to watch five episodes in a row. They don't necessarily need to do that every day. But when they do, they do it for an extended period of time. And how, so how does that relate biochemically then? It's because they have a lot of receptors and the dopamine stays in for a long time. So wouldn't they need less pleasure level activity? Like how does that interact with the Yeah, so they achieve pleasure much faster, okay. right? The, 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 their readiness for pleasure is much faster. Uh, and it, because they enjoy that pleasure response so much, they want to keep doing it. Compt isn't clearing out that dopamine, so dopamine remains to be binded to those receptors. So the pleasure response is... It's elongated. Now, the problem is, is when you have high highs, you also have low lows. So these individuals, when they, excuse me, when they fall into a rut or they don't necessarily feel good, excuse me, they can become, you know, they can start showing um, symptoms of anxiety, right? So they, they really are stuck on those negative cues. You know, they, they think things over a little bit. And when I get into talking about noradrenaline, you're going to see how these things all interact with each other. But generally, individuals who have a slow comp and a fast uh, or high DRD2 do tend to be worriers, right? They, like, they, they tend to over-worry. They tend to overthink things a lot. Um, and that's simply because they just, they just, they're not sure and they need to make sure they think about it five times and they wonder, well, could I have said this a different way and what would have been the outcome, you know? So it's uh, it can go both ways, right? Um, and then Jody, we can when we talk about your own results, what we find it's interesting. What we find is we have low DRD two, also have a slow comp. Mm -hmm. okay? Your slow comp is something I want to talk about when we get into hormones, but for the purpose of neuroendocrine function, so neuro neurological function, um, you are an individual who may, and this remember this is the important point. These aren't death sentences. It's not fatalistic in nature. It's just something that we've seen based on studies and studies and studies. Uh, you may find yourself to be an individual that isn't necessarily excited fairly quickly. Like it takes a lot for you to really become convinced or excited about something, right? You really have to think it through. You have to chew the fat. You have to evaluate its impact, right? There's others who get excited about things really quickly. That's not you. You need to think about things. Uh, for a longer period of time to really digest it. And you need to do things, um, you know, over and over again at a higher intensity to experience that pleasure. So you may be one of those individuals who enjoys, you know, thrill-seeking, right? Stuff that's over the edge, right? Like, 
rock climbing, you know, bungee jumping, skydiving. That's stuff that interests you because it's so far out there. That's the kind of stuff that gets you going. Yeah, and that would make sense. I mean, I spent a large portion of my 20s and early 30s traveling and doing mm -hmm. things that most people probably want to do. Right. Um, so the thrill seeking definitely was there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're going to shift now from dopamine to talk about noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is another neurochemical in our body. Yep. And it determines your fight or flight response. So what happens is whenever the body experiences uh, a sudden emotional stimuli, it could be a car crash, it could be a dog barking, it could be anything, the body goes into a, um, a more vigilant state. So the brain becomes more aware, you know, it's, it's, it's processing things differently, and then the body starts to prepare for a response. So blood flows increase the skeletal muscle, you're ready to act, right? And that's why it's called fight or flight. Am I going to fight or am I going to run, right? So this is controlled by noradrenaline. Now, what happens is in a normal reaction, you see a sudden thing, like, a, like you're walking down the street and a dog barks at you, so you kind of get, you know, taken aback or surprised, and then you evaluate, okay, is there a fence in front of me? Is the dog able to reach me? No, I'm safe. Yeah. Your body then returns into a normal state again, right? right. So that... And it does that by being broken down. And by the way, the same comp that breaks down dopamine also breaks down noradrenaline. Right. The difference is in the receptor. Whereas in dopamine, it's the density, so the number of receptors has an impact on the readiness with which you experience pleasure. In noradrenaline, it's, the receptor either stays on or off. There's only two things. Mm -hmm. And depending on the variation that you have, your receptor can either stay on for a longer period of time or it shuts off appropriately. Individuals who have a variation in their genes known as a deletion, an indel, which is one of the variations that our company is the only one to test for, their receptor stays on for a longer period of time. And so the emotional response is prolonged. Okay? And that's the an emotional stress response we're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's not only is it the emotional stress, it's generally the heightened emotional response. So Let's take, for example, um, you have an argument with a spouse or a partner, yeah. and that argument has an impact on you. Well, if you have a deletion in your ADRA 2B, which is the gene that controls the receptor, uh, what you will find is you're an individual who can recall that argument. You know, six months down the road, you can recall every, every word of that argument, right? You remember everything, right? It's because your emotional attachment to memory is stronger. You attach emotions to memories. Similarly, when you're walking down the street and you envision a car crash, right? If you have a deletion in this gene, you're going to remember things from that car crash, the smell, the noise, the, what you saw. Uh, and what, as you walk down that street over the next week, you're still going to, that, that, that vision of that car crash is going to stay fresh in your mind. Um, when veterans come back from the war, often a lot of veterans struggle with PTSD. Those with deletions in their ADRA 2B generally tend to be at greater risk because they just can't let go of that image, the images of their best friends who they were just speaking to just got blown up or, you know, something horrifying happened and they witnessed it. It can affect them, right, for a longer period of time. So if we look at individuals with a slow count, right, and a high DRD2, and they also happen to have a deletion, these are individuals who are at a greater risk of anxiety because they, 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 they've they sunk themselves into this negative moment and they just can't seem to get themselves out of that rut. And it can it can be heavily influenced by their genes. Okay? Right, and so then the noradrenaline is going to stay in the neuro or in the synapse for longer and it's going to be pressing that, that gene that whatever on for a lot longer as well. That yeah, so what's happening is the ADRA 2B, because it's deleted, there's a deletion, okay. it doesn't I, it doesn't tell the receptor to turn off. Right. The noradrenaline's floating in the synapse, yeah. and this receptor's on. So if your comp is slow, the noradrenaline is staying in that synapse for a longer period of time. Okay. Right? One is the comp is fast, so you're deactivating, and so the noradrenaline can't bind. But if the comp is slow, and the receptor is on for a longer period of time, then you're just having that noradrenaline keep binding to the receptor and keep eliciting that emotional response. Right. Uh, in your case, 
you do have the full version of the gene, right? Okay. You are, more than others, able to identify emotional stimuli and address them. Now, where you do have a potential um, a potential response is the next neurochemical we're going to speak about, which is serotonin. Okay. It, serotonin is the, you know, people like to call it the happy, the happy transmitter, right? The mood neurotransmitter. And it's true. It does play a significant role in mood regulation, but serotonin does a lot more than that. Serotonin, and uh, the, the gene we're studying in this case, it's not necessarily a gene. It's called a polymorphism. It's found within a gene. And this polymorphism known as 5 HTTLPR is found in the serotonin transport gene. So this is the gene that transports serotonin to the site of action. And what we're doing here, or what we're trying to understand here, is the regulation of serotonin reuptake. So serotonin is different than other neuro neurochemicals. The same serotonin that you produce is released, it binds to the receptor, and then it's re-released it's re and it goes back, right? It's not like it's cleared out. Serotonin stays in the body and it's recycled. And what we're, under, what we're studying here is those revolving doors that are allowing the serotonin to pass through and then come back. What's the function of those revolving doors? Are they functioning appropriately? When you have a deletion in your 5 HTTLPR polymorphism, those doors aren't functioning properly. I mean, sometimes they stay closed for too long. Sometimes they stay open for too long, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's, it's messing up with serotonin reuptake. Right. What this translates to is an inability for an individual to effectively compartmentalize emotional stimuli based on their urgency. What that means is I'm having a consult with you right now. I'm having a conversation with you right now. And let's say there's a, there's a clock behind me, right? If that clock is ticking loud enough, it's going to get to a point where I can't ignore that clock anymore. See, some people, they recognize that the clock is ticking, and they just ignore it. They put it in the back of their head. They're like, whatever, the clock is ticking. But for some people, it's harder to do that, right? Similarly, if you're the kind of person who's drinking coffee, and you put your coffee mug next to your computer, and you're writing an email, eventually that coffee mug is going to bother you so much that you want to go put that coffee mug in the kitchen and then come back and write your email. Okay? These individuals are the same individuals that they'll watch a horror movie 10 times in a row, and they will jump every time that scary scene comes because they can't effectively understand that this emotional stimuli, I've seen it before, and I'm just going to put in, I'm not going to be as scared from it the first time. Okay. What this also translates into uh, is an increase in irritability. What it means is people who have this deletion tend to become irritated a little bit more. Just things seem to bother them a little bit more than normal people do because they just, oh, you know, this is, this is really annoying. I just, you know, it, it, it's bothering them and they think about it. And so when you look at your emotional or your, uh, your executive function across the board, you can start to attach a lot of things together, right? How you deal with pleasure, how you deal with exciting situations, and how you deal with stimuli that you just can't seem to get rid of, okay? So people who, are, who have deletions in their serotonin also have uh, a tendency to seek out food as a coping mechanism. They're emotional eaters. Okay? Food, eating food makes them happy. It calms them down. And so when we get into diet and weight loss and understanding that, we, you know, it's not just what kind of foods you're eating. It's actually your relationship with food. You know? yeah. Are you the person that only feels better after they had a tub of haagen -Dazs? Right? That's a lot to do with how your emotional capacity is than it has to do with the kind of food you're eating. And so executive function really can allow us to understand our behaviors. And then once we are cognizant and we identify those behaviors, we can make a distinction as to how we're reacting, right? How we're responding to our environment. Uh, and then the final gene I'll talk about in, in, executive, fu in executive function is BDNF. BDNF is uh, not a neurochemical. Uh, BDF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a neurotrophin. Okay? Your BDNF gene determines the amount of BDNF you produce. The same the factor and the gene have the same name. BDNF is involved in neuronal plasticity. It's in maintaining the health of your neurons. Neurons are the cells of your brain. 
when you experience any kind of trauma, whether it's physical, like a concussion, or it's a mental trauma, like you just found out your best friend passed away suddenly from a heart attack, okay? You ever get, you ever hear that, that saying that I was shell-shocked, right? The reason people say they're shell-shocked is because you're actually experiencing the symptomology of a concussion, even though there's been no physical trauma. The, the, the effect in your brain is the same. What's happened is neuronal pathways that used to exist in your brain have become damaged, and so you sort of lose those pathways. Okay, BDNF's job is to be able to go in and initiate the production of new neuronal pathways where old ones were damaged, okay? When you don't produce enough BDNF, number one, your recovery from emotional and physical trauma is going to be elongated, okay? So if you've had a concussion, it's going to take you a longer time to recover from that concussion. If you've gone through some mental trauma, it's going to take you a longer time to recover from that. It also plays a role, low BDNF, in neuroticism. It's that hamster wheel effect. It's that, you know, you can't seem to develop novel pathways in your brain for dealing with the same stimuli. Okay, so you become a little bit neurotic. You know, you're the kind of person who really takes their time, extra bit of time to make sure that the hair is perfectly combed and the beard is perfectly trimmed and the, the, the shirt is just right, it's ironed perfectly. It's a little bit of neuroticism that we see. Uh, in low BDNF. So that's one panel, right? We have six. And you can see, you know, it, it took me, you know, it'll, it can take me hours to explain to you one panel, the impact we have. Uh, but I just wanted to give you and your, your, your clients and your patients a quick overview of how much we can actually derive from the results of, 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 of an intelligent functional genomics test. And I think for me what's really interesting as well is that I'm just going to turn it down. Is that um, there's a, a link to mental health that not a lot of people talk about, right? So when we're talking about you know the genetic predisposition here, you can start to see how certain things um, are actually related to the genes in terms of mental health behavior. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I mean, when we look at, for example, when we look at uh, our serotonin gene, the 5-HTLPR, if you have dysregulated serotonin reuptake and you're clinically, you've been clinically diagnosed uh, as having depression, and you seem to be taking uh, an antidepressant that isn't working, there's a reason for that. If you're taking an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and you already have dysregulated serotonin, that drug is not going to have an impact on your depression, right? So it's not only the kind of mental disorders we can experience, it's also what are the impacts of taking certain drugs, what are the impacts of certain therapies, right? Therapy is an excellent uh, source of, of healing, but it's not going to work for everyone at the same pace, certainly not at the same pace. Some people need a lot more therapy to get through things. Some people don't need any therapy. They just need to go on a, I don't know, a hiking trip, right? It's different for every individual. And your genes can play a big role in understanding what your path to improve mental health looks like. Yeah. And it's a big, I think it's a big piece that's missing in mental health today because I, I work both in the mental health and the health sector. And so this is a beautiful combination of both. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I think what I'll do now is I'll talk a little bit about hormones because that's another big, obviously a big aspect of people's health and not a lot of people understand, yeah. especially, you know, given sort of the uh, society around hormones. So we have, for example, um, hormone replacement therapy, uh, we have the prevalence of the birth control pill, uh, and all the hormonal imbalances that women go through and sort of the impact on their health. So steroidogenesis, which is the production of sex hormones, uh, has a cycle, and it goes through every individual has that cycle occur in their bodies, right? So males and females produce progesterone, then testosterone, then estrogen. That's, that happens in males or females. And what can happen is based on the genes you carry, you can actually show a dominance towards one of the sex hormones. You can either be estrogen dominant or you can be androgen dominant, right? Testosterone is an example of an androgen. And the outcomes of those are different. So an androgen dominant individual uh, is going to be that individual who can put on muscle much quicker, uh, has a much better metabolism, has a resistance to weight gain. But the problems they're going to see is hair thinning, 
Uh, in men, they're going to see balding uh, and excess body hair. Uh, in women, you're going to see issues like po uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, reduced fertility. These are some of the, you know, the impacts of being androgen dominant. On the flip side, to be estrogen dominant has its perks and its consequences. Uh, you know, men who are estrogen dominant generally tend to have a full head of hair. They don't have a lot of skin issues, but they find that they can't put on muscle as well as their counterparts can, right? So they go to the gym and they're working hard, but they can't seem to put on uh, muscle as well as they can. Women who are estrogen dominant are going to fit that prototypical stereotype of the curvy woman. They're going to have larger secondary female characteristics like, you know, larger breasts, wider hips, uh, more... Um, more catered towards pregnancy and fertility, but they're also going to have some of the consequences of estrogen dominance. You're going to have a difficult menstrual cycle, increased bleeding, tenderness in your breasts. Um, you know, you might suffer from endometriosis, particularly if you have a poor inflammatory cascade as well, which we'll get to. And so the hormonal storyboard, as we like to call it, is first understanding the... Um, the inclination of your body to produce hormones, then what happens to those hormones? Are they effectively broken down? Are you producing toxic uh, metabolites from your hormones, particularly from estrogen? And then we look at, well, how, well how, how capable is the body of dealing with toxic metabolites? Does it have an effective detoxification system? Yeah, if yes or if no, then what are the impacts? Okay, so we'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll run through yours. Uh, and sort of explain what your specific cycle looks like and then discuss how your body is dealing with some of those concerns. So when we first look at your, uh, your hormonal profile, what we are looking at is what is the ability of your body to produce uh, testosterone from progesterone. That's governed by the, imp by the function of a single gene known as CYP17A1. Okay, it determines the body's conversion from progesterone to testosterone. In your case, Jody, that conversion is slow. There's a number of benefits and a number of consequences to having slow sub 17A1. Uh, now, the benefit that we know is that a fast sub 17A1 is one of the leading genetic markers for excess body hair and hair thinning, okay? So generally when we see fast sub 17A1, those are some of the concerns that we see. Okay. Having a slow, sorry. Sorry? And you tend to see androgen dominance with the fast sub 17 Not necessarily. We're going we're gonna to explore that in a second. What we wanted, then, so once you make uh, testosterone from your progesterone, now we have to evaluate what's going on with that testosterone. There's three things that can happen. You can either convert most of your testosterone into estrogen. You can uh, convert most of your testosterone to DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. It's like testosterone on testosterone, so super testosterone, or number three, you just clear it out very quickly, okay? If you are a fast CYP17A1 and you're a fast CYP19A1, you're going to be estrogen dominant because the, the cascade is going into estrogen. If you're slow CYP19A1, then you're either going to be androgen dominant or if you have a fast clearance, you're going to be sort of right in the middle, okay? So in your case, Jody, what we have is there's two things. There's actually three things. Number one, you don't produce a lot of uh, DHT, which is good. Uh, for women, generally, excess DHT is not, you know, for men, it's a bigger concern because we're talking about benign uh, prostate hyperplasia and, and enlarged prostate and male pattern baldness. But even in women, we want to keep that DHT on the lower side. Second thing that's happening for you is that you're clearing out your testosterone at an increased rate. You have two copies of your UGT2B17 gene, okay? What that means is most of the testosterone you produce is being cleared out. The second thing, you, the third thing you have, sorry, is that you have a medium speed estrogen conversion, okay? Your CYP19A1 functions at medium speed. Okay, so overall, this is a pretty decent uh, hormonal profile, right? We don't expect to see a lot of concerns when it comes to hormonal issues with a profile like this. doesn't mean that there won't be. It's just in general, individuals with this hormonal profile don't tend to see a lot of hormonal issues. Now, you may have some issues, and we can certainly explain that, but on a general note. What I would have preferred 
is having, as opposed to two copies, one copy mm -hmm. of your UGT because that would allow you to store a lot more of your testosterone, uh, which would improve metabolism. If you want to put on muscle, that would be good as well. Yeah, muscle, muscle is slowed about it. Right, and there's a reason for that because the testosterone you produce just isn't staying long enough in your body to help you develop that muscle. Now, the, the more important thing is what's happening as a woman, what's happening to your estrogen after you produce it, okay? And when we look at your profile, I would say that I'm fairly pleased with what I see here because what we see here is that you produce low levels of all three estrogen metabolites. Our biggest concern for women is women who produce a high amount of two metabolites, 4-hydroxy and 16-alpha-hydroxy estrogen. These metabolites are toxic to the body. What they do is they induce DNA damage. And in women, this DNA damage is concentrated in areas of estrogen uh, prevalence. And that is your breasts and your ovaries, right? So, so the link between breast cancer for women and the genetic predisposition. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I was getting at. So both breast and ovarian cancer have some linkage to the, the risk factor of 4-hydroxyestrogen as a metabolite. And the reason for that is that's the metabolite that's causing the cells to mutate at the end of the day. There's DNA damage that's occurring, okay? And so when we talk about what's known in breast cancer, you know, people like to say the BRCA gene. Oh, I have the BRCA gene. Number one, everyone has the BRCA gene. You need the BRCA gene to survive. The BRCA gene repairs DNA damage. What people have to increase their risk of breast cancer is a mutation in the BRCA gene that prevents it from doing its job. So think of the BRCA gene as the fire truck that's been called to deal with a fire. Mm -hmm. If your fire truck doesn't work effectively, the fire is gonna destroy the building. But what caused the fire? We can predict what's caused that fire. And in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases when it comes to estrogen-related cancers, it's the prevalence of 4-hydroxyestrogen that increases that risk, okay? Why is this important? Number one, women need to know, I are agree. you estrogen dominant and are you estrogen toxic? The prevalence of estrogen toxicity is up to 20% of estrogen dominant women. So if you're estrogen dominant, there's a one in five chance that you're estrogen toxic as well. Okay, that's the first important thing. Maybe Number two, producing more estrogen than progesterone and then the estrogen is going down pathways that are going to predispose you to cancer so it's kind of like a double whammy yeah exactly and so secondly we need to know what's your lifestyle like are you taking hrt are you taking the pill right 90 percent of women in north america have either taken the pill or are on the pill currently right what you're doing is introducing more estrogens in your body so if you're already making toxic metabolites from your internal estrogen, what's going to happen to the estrogen you put in your body? It's going to become the same stuff. Now, the other important thing is it doesn't matter what kind of hormone you take. It will all end up in estrogen. Okay? If you take progesterone, that progesterone will convert to testosterone eventually and then convert to estrogen. If you take testosterone, the same thing. And if you take estrogen, it's the same thing. It all ends up in the same bucket. Okay? Now, the third thing we need to know about hormonal health is how well your body detoxifies itself of these metabolites mm -hmm. in those two ways. Number one is your COMT. Okay, your COMT, catechol methyltransferase, that actually methylates these toxic metabolites, which is why having a medium or fast COMT is beneficial to a woman and having a slow COMT increases their risk. Thing, because it's not working effectively enough to methylate the 4-hydroxyestrogen molecules. The second thing is your glutathionization pathway. How good is your glutathionization pathway? And that's determined by a number of genes. Here's where it gets interesting. We're the only company in the world to test for copy number variations, which are a variation in your DNA that's not like SNPs. Okay, think of SNP testing as spelling check, right? Spell check in a word. You want to just make sure the words are spelled correctly. But copy number variations allow us to look at context, grammar, flow, and sometimes you can have an entire deletion of a gene. So if you were looking at a manual and you're reading a book and you need to know how a machine works, 
you could have an entire deletion of a paragraph that could be critical to making that gene function. In the context of our detoxification, there's two genes, GSTT1 and GSTM1. Both of these genes are tested for copy number variation, and a deletion, meaning zero copies of these genes, means you are at a significantly reduced capacity to produce glutathione. And glutathione is responsible for clearing out these byproducts that the toxic metabolites produce. So a slow comp, a poor detoxification system, coupled with an estrogen toxic hormonal profile, puts you at the greatest risk for complications from estrogen toxicity. Right? So in your case, Jody, um, we do see a little bit, I would say, suboptimal detoxification capability. Number one, you're missing one of the important genes in your GSTT1. Okay, one of the copies is missing. And in your other gene, GSTM1, you have zero copies, an entire deletion. Yeah. Okay, and coupled with that, your GSTP1 is a heterozygous. So your detoxification capabilities are markedly reduced. Okay, you have poor detoxification, you have a slow comp as well from what we discussed. Your saving grace is two things. Number one, you're not estrogen dominant. Number two, you're not estrogen toxic. Okay, yeah. but if you were to consider HRT or jumping on the pill, you know, or anything like that, then your risk can increase, particularly in your case, because of the poor methylation and detoxification systems you have. And right. also, if you're ill, right, if you have parasites or other things going on, then that's going to muck with hormone production as well, right? So the genes might Absolutely. be for healthy, you know, detoxification or healthy hormone production, but then when you become ill, it mucks with that. So regardless of what the genes say, you could be presenting pretty negatively too, depending on what's going on, right? No, absolutely. Uh, your detoxification is not only responsible for hormone clearance, it's responsible for clearing out all toxins. And those toxins can be sugars. Those toxins can be mold. That toxin can be a parasite. That toxin could be anything. Yeah. If the body is ineffective in clearing those out through the liver, then you're going to run into issues. You're going to run into issues like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You're going to run into issues like, you know, um, increased sensitivity, environmental, chemical sensitivities. Uh, you're going to run into migraines, uh, poor fatigue, uh, poor fatigue response, tiredness, lack of energy. These are all related with uh, with a poor detoxification system. Right, and so that's where you start to see how genetics can interplay with your lifestyle choices, right? And remember, and you know, part of what we do here at Utrians is, you know, we've taken this knowledge of functional genomics, and we've started to explore what are those natural ingredients that can help support you based on your genomic profile. So, detoxification is a great example. A lot of people like to use liposomal glutathione, right? It's all the rage in functional medicine. Uh, what people don't realize is when you have a sufficiently poor detoxification profile, like me, you can actually over-glutathionize yourself. Because what happens is when you increase your glutathione levels, so your body was not producing enough glutathione. Let's say you want to produce 50, and your body is producing 10. When you take liposomal glutathione, all of a sudden you went from 10 to 75 really fast. Yeah. Okay? Glutathione, when it's in large enough amounts, doesn't differentiate between friend and foe. Its sole purpose is to clear out. You bind and you clear out. So yes, you will bind to toxins and you will clear them out. But soon enough, if there's no toxins or if you know, you've just taken too much glutathione, you're going to start binding into life-saving minerals as well, magnesium, potassium, and you're going to start clearing out those well. So that's why we see in some of these really, really poor detox patients, taking glutathione gives them the same uh, symptoms as having poor detox, hmm. a lack of energy because they don't have enough potassium, don't have enough magnesium don't have enough chromium in their body because these minerals are also being cleared out way too fast. So our ideology, our thinking, our methodology is this. We know your body is producing less glutathione and what it wants to do is produce the right amount of glutathione. So instead of giving you the glutathione, I'm going to give you the tools your body needs to produce its own glutathione. So that's where we look at N-acetylcysteine, uh, alpha lipoic acid, selenium, this combination, milk, thistle, to support the body, but don't overdo it, right? Supplements, and you know, this is, we're being a little bit radical here as a company, in that we're trying to change this 
insanity in the supplement industry where the more is better, you know, take mega doses and take hyper doses. And unfortunately, what people don't realize is yes, natural ingredients are natural, but they still have an impact on your body and they have to be cleared out in the same manner as drugs do. They have to go through the liver, they have to be cleared out through the urine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you overdose it, number one, you're either peeing it out, you're not benefiting from it, or number two, you could have an impact that you didn't want to see, right? And we see that a lot. So our job, you know, and it's funny, people say you guys sound like the anti-supplement company. And we are in ways an anti-supplement company because we're saying take what you need and none of what you don't. Don't overdo it. Take exactly what your body needs and allow the body to adapt, right? Cellular adaptation. Okay, if you have a poor methylation cycle, don't overdo it with the B12. Start low and work yourself up. There's a threshold, right? And you want to improve that threshold over time. So that's some of the science, the knowledge we have that we can apply to create these formulations for people based on their genomic results. And I mean, you raised such an interesting point there because before I did my own gen genomics, my own genetic test, I was taking glutathione um, at the recommendation of one of the practitioners I was working with because it was supposed to be this amazing, you know, master antioxidant and I didn't see anything amazing about it. Um, mm -hmm. and I was like, hmm, maybe I'm just super toxic. And then I did my own genetics and I was like, oh, I don't actually use glutathione very well because I have all these deletions. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then I started to understand why glutathione wasn't working for me and changed my supplementation based on that. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to, what you're going to find is, you know, suggestions that people give for taking supplements. It's the same concept. It's, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Right. So for some people, methyl B12 is going to show massive improvement in their health. Well, that's because the genes involved in using methyl B12 weren't functioning well. So you gave them methyl B12. For some people, giving them methyl B12 can have the exact opposite effect. You can take a methyl B12 and have a headache. And the reason for that is you're over-methylating yourself. You don't need a methyl B12. You need a denosyl B12 or hydroxy B12, right? That's important because, you know, it's just you see this so much. You know, when we talk about folate, right, everyone in functional, you know, in natural health, they promote 5-MTHF, 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. Well, for some individuals, particularly those who can't use 5-MTHF appropriately based on a gene called the SHMT1, you're going to over-methylate yourself. And that can pose a risk to your health. So it's just, you know, it's just understanding how to use supplements in an effective manner, in an intelligent manner, not just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. It just doesn't work that way. I agree with you, and I think the, you know, we haven't really talked about methylation here, but I think the MTHFR gene and the methylation cycle is super popular right now in the functional health community, and knowing your genetics is, I think, really important to understand how to properly supplement mm -hmm. for variances in that cycle, right? Absolutely, and here's the thing that people, you know, may not necessarily, uh, they may not pick up, is methylation is a cycle, okay? And every gene plays a specific role in that cycle. So if you have suboptimality in one of those genes, it doesn't mean you're going to have an outcome, right? Methylation is huge in the autistic community. And in fact, the MTHFR is the most talked about gene. If you know, if you go into autism and if people are into that kind of stuff, they always talk about MTHFR, MTHFR, MTHFR. Well, MTHFR is only one part of the puzzle. So you can have an optimal MTHFR and display symptoms of autism. You can have a suboptimal version of MTHFR and be completely normal. And the reason for that is MTHFR is not fatalistic. It's not a defining uh, genomic factor in the development of some of these issues, right, some of these disorders. Um, so you, you, it's an important point. In functional medicine, yes, we want to know MTHFR and methylation, but we want to know what's happening before, you know, with the SHMT1. We're looking at the MTRR. We're looking at MTR. We're looking at FUT2. All of these things need to be understood in a holistic manner before a decision is made about your health. And I think you, that's another great point, and it brings us kind of back to the 23andMe, right? And, and looking at how one individual gene isn't necessarily painting the whole picture, and that's why I really love this test, because you're starting to paint with multiple colors, so you're getting that depth of, you know, I just, I don't want to look at the MTHFR alone, but I need to look at A, B, C, D, E, F, 
and see how they're all interplaying. And when I understand how they're interplaying, then you kind of know how to how to move forward. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, and you said you said it perfectly. So, uh, so I mean, that's you know, we've covered quite a bit today. Uh, I'm happy to answer any of the questions you have, but I just wanted to give you obviously an understanding of some of the important results we found in your own profile, as well as giving. Uh, sort of introduction to your patients and your clients about what it is that we can determine uh, from our test and our, you know, our programs. And um, thank you so much for the time. If you have any other questions, we'll take them now. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah, um, just one of the things I wanted to mention is that you actually are unique in that you'll blend supplements based on your genetic profile. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So what we, and this was what I was getting at was, you know, a lot of people, when they do a genetic test, they want to know what now, right? They want to know, okay, I've learned all this information. Everything you've told me is super important. Is there anything I can do to improve my hormonal imbalance? Yes. From a natural perspective, I don't want to take drugs, but can I take some greens? And the answer is yes, absolutely. There are clinically studied ingredients, validated ingredients that you can find on all the major, you know, medical publishing uh, websites like PubMed, for example, of natural ingredients that have shown an impact either directly on ger genetic expression or on the enzyme that these genes control. So a great example is DIM, dyne methane. It is a known aromatase inhibitor. And so if you are, you know, if you're an estrogen dominant woman, you want to be able to explore using DIM as a supplement. Now, the point that's important here is the industry standard for DIM is something like 150 to 200 milligrams. The important thing to note here is that most of these ingredients, we don't fully understand how they work. What we do know is that they act as modulators. And what that means that one dose, they can have an impact on a gene. And at another dose of the same ingredient, you can have the opposite impact. Mm -hmm. So the doses that we've studied for DIM, for example, to inhibit aromatase expression is 50 milligrams, right? At 200 milligrams or 200 plus milligrams, you can actually incite aromatase production mm -hmm. because it's a modulator. Right, so now it comes back to com competition. And so our philosophy is dose at the lowest effective dose and work up from there. And so what we've been able to do is take all of these clinically steady ingredients and we source them from, you know, from around the world, best in class, clinically validated, transparent, trans, you know, pure, uh, organic and non-GMO are possible. And we're actually able to compound them and customize them, personalize them, based on your DNA. It's the first company of, the, of, of its kind in the world, and we're very happy to be working with clinicians as such as yourself to offer that opportunity to your patients. And I think that's what um, makes you very unique, right, is that you're not only getting results that are like, okay, now what? But mm -hmm. there's a, now what? Well, I look at supplementation, and mm -hmm. every single gene on your report has supplements that you can take to optimize that genetic function, right? Yeah, it's uh, not only is it, so it's not necessarily we're going to optimize genetic function, but it's going to be a ingredient that's going to support the suboptimal result of that gene in some way, or fashion, or form. It may, you know, we, for example, if you can't metabolize certain food groups effectively enough, we're not going to mess around with that gene. What we are going to do is give you supplements we know improve metabolism, supplements like L-carnitine, for example. Right, so we study that, we understand the impact and you know of these genes, and then we determine, and not only a supplement protocol, but diet protocol. Should you be on the ketogenic diet or the paleo diet? Should, what kind of keto, keto diet should you be on? You know, people have this weird notion that the ketogenic diet is steak and avocados every day, right? And it's, it's I mean, it's, uh, it's a crazy concept for people to understand, and it's one that people would love to jump around and get behind, but if you're from the Mediterranean region, for example, the ketogenic diet in North America can be harmful to your health. You want to focus on a ketogenic diet that's built around your geographical ancestry. So your ketogenic diet will be Mediterranean focused in nature. You'd be looking at olive oil, olives. Uh, you're looking at, you know, fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, etc. You're not. You shouldn't be eating a steak a day. You shouldn't be eating avocados all the time. You want to ensure that you are eating based on your genotype, and that's what we're able to do, right? Uh, we're able to tell you what kind of exercise you should do, okay? Some people think that the key to losing weight is cardiovascular exercise. Yes, but not in all cases. If you have poor cardiovascular inflammatory response, cardiovascular exercise can actually aggravate the inflammatory response. For some people, 
they could literally run themselves into a heart attack, right? Which is, you know, not a lot of people understand that. So for those people, they should be lifting weights instead as opposed to running. So it's, it's, it provides, this is what I, when, you know, I go back to what I said in the beginning of my talk, we are providing people an opportunity to change their behavior. Okay, we want to change the way you look at your health. And if we can't do that, there's no point in giving you our product. We want to make sure that it happens. That's why we work with clinicians like yourself. Which is so fantastic because I think, you know, even at the end, you're just kind of adding more layers of knowledge that you can get from this genetic testing. And I know for myself, um, you know, I'm still digging into some of the results, but it's definitely been a huge eye-opener for me to, A, understand my propensity to respond in certain ways. And then the other big thing is just knowing how to properly supplement um, for my own health conditions, right? Um, so I'm super excited to be able to offer this to clients and I'm super excited to work with you. Excellent, same, We're just as excited as you are. Uh, once again, thanks to you for allowing us to come in here and talk about what we do and uh, thank you to your clients and patients who are listening or will be listening to this. And we look forward to working with all of them uh, here at the DNA Company in Nutrient.